Uh, I'm Joey. I'm an uh, economics PhD, and this question is to Frank. Uh, so there are there are, uh, there are dem democracies that works well, for example, in the United States, and there are democracies that, that doesn't doesn't work well, for example, in India. So do we have a cookbook for perfect democracy, and can democracy uh, implement it, or do we need a dictator to implement <laughs> this cookbook if it does exist? Um. Well, no, I don't think that there's a cookbook. I mean, I teach, you know, basic comparative politics uh, course in, you know, my uh, university. And I think, you know, one of the lessons of that is that the actual um, institutions have to suit, uh, you know, the, the underlying society. And so, for example, something like federalism may not be necessary in a relatively small country like, you know, Israel or the Netherlands, but in a really large, diverse one like Brazil or India or the United States, it's it's almost a necessity. And so, I do think that, you know, in a way, this kind of gets at, uh, especially Peter's point about multiple modernities. I guess the question is, functionally, at what point do these different modernities really become true alternative ways of organizing a society? And at what point are they simply variants on, you know, the same basic theme? And so I've always thought that uh, you can have a parliamentary or presidential form of government. Uh, as I've gotten older, I actually think par parliamentary systems tend to work better than our presidential one. But that that's not a fundamental difference because, they're, you know, both of these are based on same common set of principles of liberty and equality. Uh, and you, they're just different implementations of the same uh, principle. And I guess the question then is, there's no question that there's multiple ways of organizing, in effect, you know, state, law, and uh, democracy. But at what point do they become so different that you'd actually say that they're qualitatively a different kind of regime as opposed to simply a slightly different way of organizing and, and trying to deal with the same uh, functional underlying problem, and I guess where I would, how I would respond to Peter is, I think a lot of those differences either over time are going to disappear because some of them are not going to be viable or, you know, they're, um, uh, or, or they, they will not emerge into true alternatives, but simply uh, kind of variants, uh, variants on a theme. Professor, Professor Gattenstein, you taught me uh, GOV1817. Uh, when I was eight years old, right, I'm sitting in my home in Calcutta uh, on the TV. There's this building on fire, right? I'm sitting with my dad and mom. I'm, I'm eight. I don't know shit about the world. Uh, the other, within a minute, a plane crashes into the other building, and it's 9-11, uh, it's September 11. In India, we don't say 9-11, we say 11-9, uh, 2001. Ten years later, I was in your class. I was sitting there. You, uh, It was the single most important lesson I have learned in my life so far, I'm getting emotional, I'm sorry, it is. You took out uh, a dollar, you handed it to the crowd, and, and you told the student to tear it. Then you took out five dollars, you handed it to my friend Shweta, who's from India. Five dollars in India is 650 rupees. And she refused to tear it because she said, that money can feed a family. But you told her to tear it and she tore it. You handed me a green piece of paper, it was a tea bag, and I tore it. Nobody in the class winced because it was just a piece of green paper, right? And then you started to talk about constructivism, you started to talk about identity, the third, you know, charters of international relations. I was completely, that question on 9-11 was answered by that act of just staring a dollar or five dollars or ten dollars or fifty dollars, a hundred dollars. I believe and I know that history is not shown by economy, history isn't you know, bounced off by economy. Nobody cares at the end of the day about economy. It's about identity. Identity is the single most important reason why I'm Hindu and why I'm concerned about the future of India as a Hindu. And as a student, I'm very lucky that I live in the United States. My family can sponsor me in the United States. My question to you, are you concerned about India? Because I'm very concerned about Narendra Modi. If you cut out the dollar, the rupee from Narendra Modi's promises of economic development, I go to Gujarat, yes, Gujarat is very developed. West Bengal isn't, I'm from Calcutta. I'm concerned about Narendra Modi is, because of his radicalism. Is there a question the there? The question is, are you concerned about Narendra Modi? Because in 2002, he was responsible for the death of 2,000 Muslims. And I ask this as a Hindu, are you concerned about that? 
And this is a question on constructivism and identity, not economy. So let me take the liberty of of reformulating it slightly to address uh, also Frank's thing. Frank thinks about history as a glacier which is being eroded by water running down. These differences will 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 go away over time. Uh, identities get reconstituted and reimagined, right? I doubt that they will go away. I don't think, you know, I, when I was in high school, I got up every Wednesday morning at 6 o'clock to learn Esperanto. <laughs> right? That was my generation's dream of a united Europe. It didn't work out that way. The modern language regime in Europe is India's. It's three plus, mi three plus minus one language. If you're lucky in southern England, you only learn English, you get to fine. In the Basque country, you need three languages. You know? So India is the model for the modern European language regime, and Esperanto is no use, right? So the, I don't think, I was arguing that the past, that these civilizational entities draw on their past to cope with the common challenge. And one very important part of this past is a, a redefinition and reimagination of their identities, right? And I think that's a difference with Frank, who thinks about modernization and the growth of the middle class as a long-term secular process which will wash out differences. So for him, the civilization of modernity is a middle class society and increasing numbers of democracies. And for me, it's, that's one part, but it interacts with the other part, which reconstitutes differences all the time. That's a big difference between the two of us. Other questions? Thank you. Uh, my name is Namat Barzanji. I'm a researcher in Islamic studies mainly, and basically also in the Middle East. I would really like to ask uh, Professor Fukuyama to rethink his model in analyzing the, the possible alternative, because uh, first, you were not fair in presenting the different models equally well. Second, you had the different standards in analyzing these models. And let me give you an example. One is you immediately brushed the Islamic model by using the worst two examples, Saudi Arabia and Iran. They do not represent the Islamic model, nor do the recent what's called or call itself Islamic State, because neither of them properly understand, not only apply, understand Islam. And I would like you to go back and really read about the basic principles of Islamic civilizations. I'm not being apologetic. I'm trying to make his correction about how to understand history. Thank you. Well, look, I, um, I'm not sure that you're disagreeing with me because I've argued in various uh, places that I don't see any fundamental contradiction between Islam properly understood in democracy. And you've got uh, Islamic states like Indonesia and, you know, Turkey, uh, Senegal that have actually done pretty well. Uh, so I don't think I'm, I'm you know, judging. I, I'm, I'm just saying, is that kind of radical uh, theocracy that fundamentally rejects uh, liberalism, essentially, it, it fundamentally rejects tolerance uh, of alternative religions, uh, is that a attractive, sustainable, uh, higher form of, of political organization uh, that you know will be a, a, a challenge in the long run? I just don't think that. But is you know Turkey going to remain a uh, democracy in which religion is extremely important? Yes, I think it will. But it still remains fundamentally, in, in my view, a a democracy. If I could just make a quick point to ask Frank and Peter if I'm thinking about this correctly, and it bears on some of the questions. It seems to me that Frank's argument is that you can have multiple identities. You can have multiple cultures, uh, religions in the world. He's talking about the political system that is intact in those different countries. 
In other words, you can have a Turkey, a Germany, a Japan, and an America that have very different cultural traits. But in his story, what you're getting in the end is a political system, liberal democracy, that everybody is heading towards. So I didn't see him being that different than you or that inconsistent with the argument that you were laying out. I saw Frank as being consistent with your point. Am I right on yeah. that? Well, it, it reduces the concept of liberalism to proceduralism. And I think liberalism about a whole lot more. So the claim that the U.S. is a liberal democracy is not about the proceduralism of its political institutions. It's about the content of the ideas motivating the American Republic. And the content of those ideas is deeply contested and contested. And it's very different from Indonesia, Senegal, Germany, or anywhere else. So liberalism, thin liberalism, a thin understanding of liberalism is about political organization. But that is not what liberal democracy is about, in my understanding of Frank's work. Well, that's right. You know, I think the place where the rubber hits the road is in the following situation that comes up in Europe quite frequently these days. So you have a Muslim family in Amsterdam or in, you know, Brixton or someplace where the family wants the daughter to have an arranged marriage and the daughter doesn't want it. And then the question is, you know, how does the state respond to this, you know, this kind of situation? And uh, I actually think that if you understand liberalism uh, properly as I do, I don't think there's any question that the, the state needs to intervene on the side of the daughter because her rights trump the communal rights of a particular uh, religious minority. But there's a lot of people, you know, in Europe that don't believe that. They really don't. They fundamentally don't believe that. And that's a, you know, I think that's going to be a very neuralgic uh, issue that uh, liberal theory just really has a, you know, it, it has a hard time defining its own limits and the extent to which it pushes out of this narrow, as you call it, procedural box into, you know, kind of dictating in social life how individualistic we are, basically. Right. So in that sense, so I guess I'm... <laughs> no, no, that's, that's a good yeah. formulation. Yeah. Just to clarify this just a bit, when I criticized Frank up there, uh, I made the point that if you go back to the beginning with regard to liberalism, people could not agree on first principles or what comprised the good life. And what liberalism was all about was rights. It's not just procedure, it's all about rights. And it's giving people the right to live the good life as they see fit, right? So I see you as boxing off rights and democracy, right? And leaving lots of room for people in civil society to act the way they see fit. But what you're saying here, just on the rights front, is that there's no simple set of rights, right? That's what's going on here. You're, you're in the rights box, right? Mm -hmm. And the problem is that there's not universal agreement on what the rights are and then how you play off right A versus right B. And the Supreme Court, of course, gets into the business of adjudicating on this issue all the time. Yeah. Well, okay, so this is a good example of how I think that you can still have a kind of universalism of institutions and this glacier will start to melt. So right now, you've got this civil war going on in the Middle East between Sunnis and Shiites. Uh, it's unusual because this is not a war that's been going on for hundreds and hundreds of years. This is something new. Uh, and they're killing each other, and it replicates in many respects the Protestant-Catholic fight, you know, in the Thirty Years' War and in Europe in the 16th, 17th centuries. Uh, and one very interesting question down the road is, will they arrive at the same conclusion and arrive at liberalism, not because it's in their cultural tradition, but just it's a pra pragmatic way of not killing one another. And I guess I would argue that that's how, yeah, you're right, I agree with you completely. That's how liberalism arose in the first place. Uh, it wasn't deeply embedded in Christian European civilization, but it, you know, it was a necessity that, that these societies were driven to as a result of their historical experience. And I could see that happening in another, you know, generation in the Middle East once they get sick of sectarian, uh, you know, violence. 
but it still doesn't answer a lot of these very complex social questions about exactly how you define the rights, you know, the family versus the individual and all of these sorts of things. And there, I actually think that the United States uh, is a real outlier. I mean, we are so much more individualistic socially than any other civilization in the world. And therefore, I think the way we defend our individualism is just not going to be accepted by a lot of other societies, because most of them are just, they take communalism in various forms much more seriously than we do. Other questions? Yes. This question is for Dr. Fukuyama. Um, the third section of your talk was called What's Wrong with Democracy? And I feel that you went on to underline what you thought uh, makes up a democracy and how the transition from different forms of um, ideologies and governments become a democracy. But I, I didn't, I would love for you to clarify uh, what's wrong with democracy. Well, so the, I guess the simplest way of putting it is that democracy is an institution about the constraint of power. But good government and what people want from government is not just to constrain power, it's also that power should actually do things. So, you know, an example you could give in India, you know, in certain of the northern states and uh, poor states in uh, northern India, 50% of school teachers don't show up for work despite the fact that they're being paid. And therefore, nobody gets an education, right? Although they're democratic, there's a free press, there's opposition parties, there's you know, lots of political contestation, but they cannot deliver this basic service. And I think that's been the Achilles heel of very many democracies, including in some respects the United States, that people want the government <coughs> to actually do things for them, provide public goods, services, infrastructure, you know, so on and so forth, and they're incapable of doing it. They're too corrupt, they don't have the capacity, uh, and uh, they don't, you know, uh, implement things well. So that's that's the simple argument, that government is not just about constraining power, it is also about the, you know, it is a, a, about the legitimate exercise of power. And that's the part that's been the weakness. I think we're going to leave it there. I want to thank Professor Fukuyama, Professor Katzenstein, and Professor Mirshan. Thank you very much.